Hi folks, this is Jason and I hope you're okay today. Uh, we're going to have a few minutes on why and how to read the Bible. Um, I'm going to give you some advice on why we should read the Bible, how to read the Bible, and um, I hope it's going to be an encouragement to you. So let's just come before the Lord. Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for your goodness and your love and your blessings. We give you the praise and we give you the glory today we thank you for all your goodness and all your love and father we just pray that this video would be a blessing and a help and an encouragement to people in your name amen amen okay so why should we read the bible why should we read the bible well let's turn to 2 timothy if you've got a bible 2 timothy chapter 3 verse 16 and 17 2 Timothy um, chapter 3 2 Timothy cha chapter 3 and verse 16 and 17 it says all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. The reason why we should read the Bible is because it's the word of God. What that means is the Holy Spirit of God worked through man to write the Bible and so we have a book that teaches us, rebukes us, and corrects us, and it's a book from God. This book, the heavenly book of God, has come to give us a relationship with God. If you turn to 2 Timothy 3.15, it says, And from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. So the Holy Spirit of God gave the word of God so that we could be wise unto salvation, so we could have a relationship with God. If you turn to John 5.39, the Gospel of John 5.39, we read, Search the Scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. So the scriptures testify of Jesus and you will not come to me that you might have life. And if you want life, you will come to Christ through the word of God. If you don't want life, you will not come to the word of God. Now these scriptures will, as we read them, will help us to be like Jesus. 2 Corinthians 3.18 2 Corinthians 3.18 2 Corinthians 3.18 But we all with open faces behold in all in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory even as by the Spirit of the Lord. We are changed as we read the Word of God. The Word of God not only gives us salvation, a relationship, not only does it change us, it gives us joy and peace in the midst of a storm. Psalm 23, 5. Psalm 23, verse 5. Thou preparest a table before me, the presence of my enemy. Thou anoints my head with oil, and my cup burneth over. God will help you in the midst of the storm and the midst of difficulties. He will guide you. Guidance, Psalm 119. 119, verse 105. 105. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The word of God is a light unto my path. The word of God is a defense against spiritual attack. Matthew chapter 4. Matthew 
The word of God is a defense against spiritual attack. Matthew chapter 4 verse 20. And they straight away left their nets and followed him and going out from from thence he saw other two brethren James the son of Zebedee and John the brother in the ship with Zebedee the sorry um, Matthew 4 that's it Matthew 4 that's it Matthew 4 verse 1 then was Jesus led up out of the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil and when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights he was afterward a hungered when the temper came to him he said if thou be the son of God command that these stones be made bread but he answered and said it is written man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God so when the devil was tempting the Lord the Lord said no I'm living by the word of God the word of God helps us in spiritual the word of God gives us power Hebrews 4 1 2 1 Hebrews 4 verse 12 for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-inch sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And the word of God cleanses us, John 15, 3. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. So the word of God is the word of God, it's inspired of God, it gives us a relationship with him, it gives us salvation, it changes us, it helps us in a storm, it guides us, it's a defense against spiritual attack, it's powerful and it cleanses us. So you might say, well I, I, I'm not so sure if I do believe the Bible is the word of God, there are difficulties in the Bible um, and I find that the, they're difficult uh, and I, I wonder if it is the Bible, well there are prophecies that prove the Bible, we can do historical studies, I know that one of the big problems with people in the Old Testament is violence in the Old Testament, but the context is God and if God wants to wipe out a nation, he has a right to do so, God is God. We can't tame God into our own image, you have to let God be God and we can't make a religion out of our own minds we, we allow God to be God and we look at things through Christ all things through the Jesus Christ every question about scripture has to come back to Jesus Christ so I'm just going to read a few uh, quotes about the Bible Oswald Chamberlain Chambers said when you fear God's word you fear nothing else the word of God is to be respected Rufus court said no lawyer can afford to be ignorant of the Bible Samuel Taylor Coldridge said for more than a thousand years the Bible collectively taken has gone hand in hand with civilization science law in short with the moral intellectual cultivation of the species always supporting and often leading the way Charles Coulson the Bible banned burned beloved more widely read more frequently attacked than any other book in history Generations of intellectuals have attempted to discredit it. Dictators of every age have outlawed it and executed those who read it. Yet soldiers carried into battle believing it more powerful than their weapons. Fragments of it smuggled into solitary prison cells have transformed ruthless killers into gentle giants.
Hey, Jason, how you doing, buddy? Hello? Hey, what's going on, buddy? Hi, mate. You okay? Yeah, doing good, man. Good to talk to you. Yeah, just I, I know if you saw that I was here, just want to say hello. It seemed like I was being creepy and just listening in here. <laughs> All right. Sorry, mate. I didn't know you were there. <laughs> no, no. I just came in, buddy. I'm just doing a, a little Bible study, mate. Oh, no worry. You're more than welcome to continue. I'm just here listening, so it's no big deal. Are you okay? I'm sorry? Are you okay, Skylar? Yeah, life's been good lately, man. Got a promotion at work. Uh, uh, got a good family. I can, you know, I can't complain about much, to be honest with you. <laughs> You're looking good, mate. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. <laughs> How are things going for you, Jason? Okay, yeah. I've had a good day, mate. Uh, yeah, fine, mate. Yes, I'm what's, the, uh, what's your uh, what do you, what kind of Bible study are you doing tonight? What's the topic of it? it it's about why um, why read why read God's word and uh, how to read God's word. So, oh, okay. So we just looked at um, why read God's word. So I don't know if you got the first bit of it. So it was just about number one that it's the word. It's looking from it from a Christian perspective. But if you want to ask questions, you can. Um, sure. It's about that the Bible says it's the Word of God, um, and then other reasons to read it is it talks about salvation, um, that you can know salvation, that you can have a relationship with God, that the Word of God changes you, that it gives you joy and peace in a storm, that it can guide you, that it's a defense against spiritual attack, that it's powerful, and it cleanses you. So I don't know if you've got any thoughts about that. You, you're welcome to share a few thoughts, mate. Uh, you know, the one thing that always uh, I always had kind of a question with, and I'd just love to hear your thoughts on, is uh, when it comes to Scripture, uh, I've heard it said that it's the inspired Word of God, right, uh, and that it's it's perfect in every way. But what I, what I would ask is, is uh, you know, we could say it was inspired by God. That's fair enough. Um, but we, we, would, we would both probably agree that it was actually physically written down by man. Yeah, yeah. Uh, man has free will, therefore man is fallible. He can make mistakes. Yeah, uh, and has the choice uh, whether now God can inspire him. He can be like, "Hey, this is what I want you to write." Yeah, but really, in in the end, it seems like it would be up to man, whoever wrote the Bible, to um, uh, choose whether he wants to write God's inspired words or not. So, in a sense, can it be perfect? If it is just inspired, but in the end, God, I mean, humans really did write it. Yeah, uh, it's a good question. Have you got, have you got a Bible on you? Uh, I can pull one up on the internet. Pull up, uh, if you pull a Bible, um, if we look at 2 Corinthians 3, chapter 3, verse 3. Uh, 2 Timothy 3.16. Are we doing, did you say 2 Corinthians 3? Uh, 2 Timothy. We just go to... Oh, I'm sorry. 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy. Um, sorry, go, you can go. I'm, I'm pulling it up now. <laughs> sorry. 3.16, it says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Mm -hmm. So... The question is, what does inspiration mean? Because that, that's really what it... Because your question comes down to what do we mean by in, inspired in a way? Because there, we could have different conceptions of inspired. I mean, hmm. you know, like someone could be um, in a room and sort of... I'm not, I'm not saying it can happen, but I'm just saying they could, they could feel like in, jump up and give you a hug and they're inspired to do that or... Mm -hmm. Next day, say they've had a vision, uh, a dream, and they were inspired to share that dream with you. Uh, mm -hmm. So, like, when we're talking about inspired, we have to define what we mean. And I think, I mean, this is how I understand it. Um, mm -hmm. But the evangelical perspective is that the Holy Spirit controlled the writers. Um, so the word when it says all scripture is given by inspiration of God the Greek the idea is it, the word of God is breathed out of God that's the idea there um, 
so when the writers are writing mm -hmm. at the same time um, God's spirit was in complete control at the same time as using the style and the intelligence and the learning and the gifts now how the divine and the human can connect I don't know how that works but those are the two two ends of this of the two two sides of the coin so like mm -hmm. in Isaiah, Isaiah was a statesman so you, you can feel the style of a statesman in that in the book of Isaiah Paul um, was a very he was learned uh, in Greek culture and learned as a Pharisee and you see that style coming out in his letters um, Luke was a doctor and you see that style medical aspect coming out in his in in the Gospel of Luke and in Acts where there's quite a lot of medical terms brought out so you get the human element of the gift of the individual uh, but from a evangelical perspective we're, we're saying that you know the Holy Spirit was in control of it as well and so we say that you know God um, the, the Holy the God himself and the knowledge of God can't make a mistake so if the Spirit of God was involved in the direction of writing the words with the writers then that's where the infallibility and inspiration comes from and that that's different that's a different conception of inspired than say say a prophet might speak a word or mm. someone might say they've had a vision so I don't know if that answers your question but that that's how how we as or how uh, Protestant evangelical Christians would see inspiration I think that's a very uh, I think that's actually a really good answer to be honest with you Jason because in a sense it's kinda like the people who wrote the Bible they allowed the Holy Spirit to come into them for the Holy Spirit to write its perfect word. Yeah. Am I saying it right? Yeah, yeah. And the, but in some way, in some re way, I don't know how, the Holy Spirit hmm. used their talents, the 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 gifts, you know, their knowledge. So like, hmm. the, Luke had a knowledge of medical stuff, and that comes out in his writings. Paul, Paul was a great logician, and logic comes out quite a lot in Paul's writing. Uh, and um, Isaiah was a great statesman, and uh, that comes out in his writing. And and yet, the Holy Spirit, at the same time, made sure that what he wanted to say was was put in, put in what what was to be said. And because he is infinite and infallible, he protects them from making a mistake. That that's how evangelicals see it. Whether people agree with that, uh, yeah, I think that's a. I'll be honest. I think that's a fair enough answer, because it it kind of, it deals with the idea of free will. You know, they're freely giving uh, themselves to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's giving the message and writing through them. It doesn't seem to contradict anything. I think that's fair enough. Absolutely. Uh, that that um, a guy. Uh, someone, if you wanted to like do theological study, one of the the Princeton theologians of 1920s uh, de developed uh, this kind of understanding more. If you wanted to read mm. like theology mm. stuff and stuff like that, uh, and people like evangelical scholars like um, Al Muller, a Southern Theological Seminary and people like that, you know, you might be worth reading or someone like Francis Schaeffer might be a help to you if you wanted to read stuff. Oh, I appreciate that, man. Um so but the thing is is that if you if you're if you are open to, to reading it the the Bible, um that it is about an invitation to a relationship and it's a spirit it's a spiritual experience as as well as an intellectual experience and, and God invites you to have a relationship with God through his word and so when you're reading the Bible it's kinda of like you've got a body that that mm -hmm. wants food and, and you eat food and, and that keeps you going but you've got a like, you've got a spiritual side to you and, and that needs spiritual food and the mm -hmm. Bible's like spiritual food it, it, it nourishes you and so that's one of the reasons why to read the Bible is is, is it 
nourishes your spiritual in it and it, it helps you to have this relationship with God um, because like you know you get you get many crackpots or many people saying they've they've had visions and they've seen this happen or they've seen that and that can be very um, subjective and it could it could be very dangerous because you know a voice might say to them to do something and it's crazy hmm. um, but the Bible ensures that that you've got you've got some kind of check on your your experience. You can check um, you can check that relationship if if it's okay or not, and and whether you're doing the right thing, type of thing as well. Uh, and it, it helps you to and also it helps you to have that relationship. So like when I read the Bible each day, it it you know like um, I was reading a book. Uh, mm -hmm. on philosophy and it was really helpful it was really interesting and it's really good but it can't feed you spiritually it can't it can't give you that experience of a relationship whereas when you read the Bible there is this real um, mystical experience that you do have I mean I know you, you might not agree with that but you, you can have that relationship and I, I find that every day I read the Bible it, it speaks to me at where I've read the Quran, I have the Quran, I have the Book of Mormon, I have other books that I read, and it, it does not meet that spiritual need. I tried to read the Quran once, and it was was a very difficult read, to say the least. Yeah. Uh, I've heard, though, that with the Quran, that it's much more, uh, if, you, if you don't understand Arabic, it's a lot harder to understand. Like It's more like, I guess, poetry is what they say when you read it in Arabic. Mm -hmm. uh, but man, more power to you for getting a chance to read that the Quran, man, because I couldn't get through it. <laughs> I tried my hardest. Well, that. That, that gets on how to read the Bible. I mean, one guy said to me uh, in a town near me where where I live called Bolton, uh, we were we had the table, and he come up to me and he said, I've, "I've read the Bible all the way through," and he read it from the Old Testament right through, and he said, "I just didn't get it. It was boring, and I'm not going to read it again." And I said, I know it sounds a bit daft. I said, but it's not a good place to start to read at the beginning when you're reading the Bible. I said, the best place to start is to read one of the Gospels. And if if you if you've not got a unless you've got if you've got a Bible background, then yeah, read read the beginning. But if you haven't got a Bible background, the best place to start is one of the Gospels. And then when you get into the Gospels, um, start reading some of the Old Testament books like Genesis and then some of the prophetic books because some of the prophetic books like Isaiah and Ezekiel mm -hmm. unless you've got some kind of background of what's going on there you you know a lot of these prophetic books in the Old Testament they, there's also like um, there's one kings and two kings uh, in the Old Testament and unless you get the history of the kings and what's going on alongside the prophets that you're reading you're not going to really understand it Hmm. That, that takes time to study, so you're better off reading the Gospels to start with, and then when you've got time to go back over the Old Testament and to study it, uh, read it devotionally and study it as well. So, so that's my advice. If you ever, I, I don't know if you have got a background in reading it, but uh, I actually, you know, funny enough, I used to uh, be a Christian before. Uh, I was the uh, evangelical, non-denominational Christian. Uh, yeah, had a uh, you know, a decent. I'll be. You know, I'll be honest. I had a lot more Bible study back when I was a Christian. Uh, it's been a while since I've really sat down and you know read the thing through. Yeah. Uh, I recently actually did start uh, again to try to read the Bible. Uh, I've been really taking Google this Google Hangouts thing as an opportunity. Yeah. To uh, you know to open my open up to more Christian views. Uh, you know, talk to some Christians. Uh, you know, maybe challenge some of my beliefs that I have. That way, it's you know I'm not just you know I'm not just in my own little world in a sense. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and and I'll tell you, I've met some amazing people, amazing Christians on here. You know, I'll, I, you know, to tell you the truth, Jason, when I originally came on to Google Hangouts, you know, I was ready to debate and argue with people, and you know, you know, do the classic back and forth. Yeah. And I, I think sometimes maybe Christians of that too. Uh, I think maybe we all could. <laughs> we all kind of want to. Sometimes have a little fun and debate and argue and things like that. But I've, uh, 
you know, I've met some really amazing people on here mm. that, you, you know, when you start to like somebody, you don't want to argue with them anymore. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and it becomes more like a conversation. Yeah. Uh, about things. And you just, you know, even like at the end of the day, like even, even if me and you, we talk today and we talk tomorrow and we just agree to disagree on some points. Mm. You know, we can be civil, we can have conversations, and I can do something that I, I didn't know before. Mm. Uh, so, you know, now that I've been on these things, like I said, it's kind of, it's put an urge in me to, to want to know a little bit more. And, and I'll be honest, I've actually moved, like if you were to put like a scale, on the right is atheism, on the left is like Christianity. Like mm. I've moved to the left more. Like I'm definitely more of in a position of at least I think there is a God now at mm. this point. Mm. So where I go from here, you know, we'll just see <laughs> in the best yeah, terms. Uh, but, uh, you know, I don't go, you know, I, don't get me wrong, I still go on certain hangouts and have debates and arguments and things like that. Yeah. But I try to make it more intellectual. I try to get out of the area of emotions. and yeah. I'm not one of these people that will ever tell you that you're wrong for what you believe or anything like that because I could be wrong. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, but... That's kind of to give you a little idea of where I'm going. But I think uh, I am going to start reading Mark again. I think I'm going to start with reading Mark in the in the uh, in the New Testament because I did start to read the beginning, like you were kind of saying. I went back and started reading Genesis, and then we get into uh, yes. and, I, and I think that's not going to work. I think I need to start in the begin. I need to start. I need to go with Jesus first. <laughs> that's it, bro. I, I like the Jesus stuff better than the Old Testament stuff. <laughs> so. <laughs> I think in it's it's it it wouldn't work as well me doing the opposite way around. That's it, mate. Skylight, you're the star, mate. It's really nice to see you, bro. Ah, dude, no worries, man. It's glad to see you, man. I wish I, I wish I I I wish uh, I met you uh, uh, a couple of years ago on YouTube because when I'm when I'm talking to you, I feel chilled out, relaxed, and happy. You know what I mean? It's just it's just a pleasure to talk to you, mate. Oh, I appreciate that, man. Well, you know what it is, is I've been, you know, I've, I've learned a lot from Google Hangouts and with dealing with people. Yeah. And that a lot of it, what happens is, is people tend to misrepresent each other. And they, they jump to conclusions about people before they really get to know them or understand what they believe, whether it be Christianity or Christians towards atheists. And I'm not, an, obviously I'm not an atheist, I'm an agnostic at best, leaning towards deists. Um, but I think what happens is people put people into boxes and then they want to prove to the other person that they're in that box yeah. instead of just asking them and having good questions, you know? Yeah, yeah. Well, um, basically, I, I finished all I ever wanted to say on that. So I don't know if you wanted to, if you, if on the Google Hangouts, if there was anything that that's come up that you found interested or you wanted, you know, what's been what's been main, been the main conversation at the moment on the Google Hangouts? Is anything? Crops up or anything? Well, no. I mean, you always, <laughs> there's been a lot of like uh, I've, I I enjoy like, like I said. I, there's a particular Christian hangouts I go into where I don't necessarily talk. I'll just go in and listen, and I'll hear some of the arguments between Christians, like yeah. the Calvinist argument or against Calvinism, or um, whether there's a Trinity or not a Trinity. Yeah. Um, that was you know that's always been a fascinating thing to me. The, tr yeah. the idea of the Trinity. Because a couple things, or, or, why I've always kind of, I can lean both ways is what I would say. Mm -hmm. uh, like because in, in Genesis, right, in the very beginning, it says, let us create man in our, in our own image. Yeah. And it's, yeah. It's, like a refer, it's like a reference to the Trinity, Trinity from what I've understood. But what's tricky about that is that it seems like, like because it's mentioned before the fall of Adam, right? Yeah, yeah. So, in a sense, is is wasn't Jesus Christ the solution to the problem of sin? And if so, why was he mentioned before the fall? Like it was like he was already there. Does yeah. that make any sense? What I'm saying? Yeah. Like yeah. like why have the solution before the problem? Well. I I I'm not saying I I understand, uh, mm -hmm. but I I I um, a couple of things for me. I, I mean it it's it's about 
uh, for, for me, and I'm not saying I've, I fully understand or grapple with it, but I think before um, before anything happens, before creation, your position of what you believe will actually impact your understanding of reality and the way reality is. So what that means is, for example, if you believe that everything, all of matter came from nothing, mm -hmm. uh, and it, it, it started from an impersonal basis, mm -hmm. then you've got to account for why that which was not personal became personal. How did we become relational? How did we become relational beings from the impersonal? Hmm. Um, if you take the Islamic idea that God is just one, then at the beginning of time, before anything happened, God was loving. But yet, how can he be loving if there's nobody to love? How can he be in relationship? Whereas the Trinity is saying before the beginning of time, there is these three persons in one, and they're in relationship. And we were made in the image of this God to have relationship. So for me, the Trinity explains one of the fundamental bases of reality of why we're relational beings and why we create relationship. So when he says, let us make man in our image, I think that may be something to do with it, that we're made in relationship, for relationship. And the Trinity is, we're, we're reflecting the Trinity and the reality of the Trinity in that. Uh, without, without the Trinity, we can't make sense of, of love and relationship. That's what I think. Because if creation happened from the impersonal, that is, it came from nothing, then we can't even begin to understand why we're ultimately here, what hmm. purpose we have, why we, what is love, why we have relationships. Ultimately, on a grand cosmic scale, we can't do that from an atheist perspective. I gotta say, I, I really like that answer, Jason. You kind of surprised me twice now in a row <laughs> with your your answers, buddy. I, I actually that I've never heard someone say that with the idea of the relationship mm. uh, and where. But what I, what I, what, I, what I do want to say one thing. Uh, so let's take I'm, I'm going to take everything you just said. And I'm going to agree with you except for one part, the idea of nothing. Okay. Yeah. And I kind of touched on this just a tad bit with you last time I was here. Uh, what if I were to tell you there's no such thing as nothing? There is no such thing as nothing. It's just a concept. It's an idea. You can't measure nothing. You can't see nothing. There's no way to actually prove that nothing exists. It's literally a concept. So if, you're, if you were to think about the universe, and I'm not an evolutionist. I'm not trying to argue for evolution or anything like that. Yeah. Um, what I'm arguing is that everything was just there already. And, and even if I, I could still agree with what you just said, I still agree with the first part of what you were saying. Because the Trinity, the idea of the Trinity, without love, without that relationship, it's there's not a way. Like, who could God love if there isn't a relationship already? Like, the idea of the Trinity. I, I really like that concept. Mm. So, what I could say is, is there is no such thing as nothing. God, um, I don't know, it's, it's a hard concept to kind of think of the idea that, you know, God is infinite, obviously, in, in, in the Christian theology. But the universe, whatever it is, whatever you want to call matter, let's call it existence. I think that's a better word, maybe. Mm. But maybe it's part of God, in a sense, and that it's eternal also. And from the, I'm going to use the word existence instead of God, okay? That from this part of God, this existence, came the universe. So it is, it is God is the cause. Um, so it didn't come from nothing because there is nothing. There always just is. Just as God is eternal, so is his creation, in a sense. Not necessarily man. Now, I'm not going to the point where man, man's not eternal. That was later on. But maybe the existence of the universe, it is part of, part of him. 
I I understand what you're saying. Uh, it's it's kind of like a, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's it's kind of a deist kind of perspective. Well, yeah, it would definitely be. <laughs> that's there's no doubt. It'd be more deist. Yeah. I well, still I, think your guy could work with this, though. I th I think the idea of Christianity still kind of could go along with this. But go on. But I think you lose you unless you have. Um, I mean, you could uh, develop a trinity from nature. You could say, look at human beings. Within human beings, there's maybe consciousness and three parts in con I don't know, three parts in consciousness. I don't know. But I think yeah. the Bible definitely gives a trinity, um, whereas deism is definitely not a trinity. And so there is an issue there of how one... Um, with the Bible, God is... Great, he's out there, he's over nature, but he's a God that you can have a relationship that communicates, that speaks, that acts. Mm -hmm. um, whereas the deist concept is a God that sets in motion creation, and then he somehow, it's difficult to understand how we have a, a relationship with this God. Uh, and so. Yeah, yeah. So I, I see what you mean. Um, I'm not saying uh, uh, you definitely can argue for a deist uh, perspective from creation, um, but it only gets it, it gets you so far in terms of it. There are I don't think it would explain relationships because this deist god that you could deduce from nature. Um, if it's one God with no three nature, three persons within it, how would it love if there was nothing to love at the, before anything existed? Yeah. Oh, what I was saying, I wasn't. I might. Have, I might. Have, I might have misspoke. Um, I won't, I'm not. I'm not arguing for a deist God. What I'm saying is, is that your God could still be true if there's no such thing as nothing. So, like the idea, like so, when we talk about how, like. I always explain it to people, you know how there's always the debate between evolution and creation, right? The evolution is the how, not the why. It's not, it's not saying that God didn't do it. Well, what, I, what, I could, what I would argue is, I guess what you call a theistic evolutionist, to where, like, God, this is just God's way of doing it. Uh, and to me, now this is just my personal opinion, Jason, um, I think, let's just say there... The, uh, for the, for just just to say the evolution's real, okay, or some form of it, not exactly as Darwin laid it out, but the concept. There was a big bang, the Earth was created, all this fun stuff, and then from there life came on the Earth. Da 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 da. Um, it doesn't change the anything, in my opinion, because everything else make is still there, because whatever point you have to get to get to Adam and Eve. It's still it's all all it's doing is talking about the process. It's not talking about how. And to me, that's so much more beautiful. It's so much more amazing. And when I read Genesis, I think about it what what they're describing in the first chapter of Genesis before you get to the Adam and Eve when it starts describing the, the way the universe was formed. But like the first book, uh, and I'm just gonna is that okay real quick? I just want to read it because I want to show you how I think it makes sense. Mm. With you know it's. And similar. Give me just one second, okay? Um, so I know the first one is in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. To me, that would be the Big Bang. God created the stars and the earth, okay? Mm. All right. That's the earth is matter. Don't think of it like the physical earth yet. I'm going to get to where that comes in. So earth is like physical matter, okay? So God creates the stars, the matter, the physical thing, the Big Bang. All right, and then we get to Genesis 2. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, so matter and the stars are finished, and all the host of them. So the whole universe is created. Um, and it says second. Uh, oh, wait a minute. Hold on one second. I'm sorry. I lost the heavens and the earth were finished. Genesis chapter 1. I'm trying to get the whole thing to pull up here. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, okay, so in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was, okay. Then number two, the earth was without form and void. Mm. So what this is talking about is the planet earth hasn't been formed yet, okay? 
and darkness was over the face of the deep. So our universe, our galaxy was dark. Our sun, you know, there wasn't the light wasn't completely there yet, and the spirit of God was hovering over the uh, the face of the waters, which I think is referring to like the materials of the earth. Okay, and God said, "Let there be light." Now, what happens here? I think is now the earth is beginning to form. The earth was without void. He's filming. He's filming it. He's forming the earth. And when you start to form the earth, what happens is, is you have all that dust because they they think that when the planets were forming, basically the rocks were hit, the planets were hitting each other. These meteorites or this 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 uh, the materials of the planets were hitting each other and forming a planet. And what it caused it caused all this dust in the atmosphere. So the light can't get through the atmosphere of the earth. So after the universe is created. The sun is created. The physical earth is created. Now we have this dust in the air. And now God's separating the dust from the air so the sunlight can get through. All right? So this is, you know, this is, and this is what scientists believe how the earth was formed. So it's not contradicting the Bible yet. It's still kind of going good. Uh, and so God saw it was good. Uh, and it says he separate the light from the day, night and dark, which makes sense. Now we have, now the sun can, now we can see night and day because now there's no dust in the atmosphere. Uh, and then it says, God, let's say there be an expanse in the midst of the waters and separate the water from the land. Well, that's the next step. Now we have an atmosphere because we have a clear sky. We can have water. We can have land. We can have separate things. Uh, and God called the expanse, oh, and the water is above, and, and it was so, and God called the expanse heaven, and there was an evening, morning, the second day. And God said, let the waters under the heavens by gathered together in one place, and let the dry land appear. So separating land and water. Uh, and next is vegetation, plants, seeds, trees. Makes sense still. Uh, and then we get into animals, and we get into, well, then it goes into sea creatures, which is where they think, uh, scientists, I believe, think that dinosaurs originally came from, or life came from from the ocean. So to me, it's like it doesn't contradict anything. The only thing where you it would get tricky is whether you believe it's a literal 24-hour day. And that's where I think the problems might come in. But that's all in how I guess you want to interpret it. Sorry, I didn't mean to be long-winded, but I just kind of wanted to well, throw the, out some kind of my thoughts on that. And see what you thought. Would you say um, Adam and Eve were the in this scenario is a development over billions of years to to Adam and Eve. Yeah, I think I think see now I have a unique perspective on this. See I look at them as two very good different so I think the first chapter is literally describing the creation, God's creation, okay? Um, you could take it that way. I think this is one of those things where I don't you couldn't I couldn't tell you you were wrong in this situation. I can't tell you either way. I think there's there's I think three basic beliefs what you could think in my opinion. One is Adam is a representative kind, Eve is a representative of womankind. Two, it's a literal Adam and Eve, two people. Or three, it's neither, it's a parable, it's a way of telling a moral story of what's going on. Hmm. I could either go with two of them. I don't believe the literal it's a man and a woman. I could either be persuaded to believe it's mankind womankind. I more lean towards the parable just because of the story. The idea that there's a, a speaking serpent. We have a literal tree of knowledge in there. Um, the, the whole idea to me, the story screams, uh, I don't know if parable is the right word, allegory. Mm. Uh, it screams allegory to me. And I think it's a way of explaining sin in a sense. And, and I'll explain what I mean. So, so the Garden of Eden is childhood okay and as you grow up the snake or that snake the serpent temptation comes into the world you get older the mm. serpent's going to tempt you um, the tree of knowledge is figured if as you get older you're going to get smarter you're going to understand things uh, when they start talking about Adam and Eve realizing they were naked and they, they didn't have any clothing on how they were embarrassed that's puberty. Women had to have babies. Men had to work the field. I think that the whole story is an allegory for growing up and how temptation and sin will come into the world. I'm not denying. I could still read that story and believe there's sin. Mm. I just don't believe that there's some kind of original sin, as if it's passed on. I think people can naturally be sinful, or in this in the sense of sin where you're against God or you're disobeying God. From reading that context of it. 
Uh, that that's where I, I, I what I read from it personally. Now I could be wrong. I'm not saying I'm right. Just the feeling I get, and it makes me feel more comfortable. Like if if it this that belief would get me more to general Christianity again than the idea of a literal Adam and Eve in the garden, a literal tree of knowledge. Um, I I think one of the biggest problems why. If it's okay, I, I can tell you why I, I have problems with it being a literal story, if you want to hear it. Yeah, yeah. I'd, I'd, I'd like to uh, go back when you've done that to all the stuff that you've said. And oh, well, yeah, go ahead. If you had a point, go ahead and make the – because I don't want to get too lost. I know I've said a lot, so please, please do. Just don't. Go, <laughs> can we just backtrack to a lot – you've said a lot about a lot of stuff, and, and just can we just go over that and then get – Oh, please, yeah. Um, when you talked about um, – you talked about God, and you talked about nothing doesn't necessarily mean nothing. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, I don't think there is a such thing as nothing. I think it's just a concept. Okay, so did matter always exist, or did it at some point come into existence? See, it's, it's tough, because is matter in a part, is it part of God? Like if God is very complex, which we I think we can both agree is a very complex entity. But how are you gonna? What I'm saying is, how 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 are you defining God? Mm. And then, if you're not gonna answer the question, did matter come into existence? How does that relate to the definition of your God? I would say that. Matter has always existed. Okay. So matter has always existed. Mm -hmm. And it's part of God. And so if matter has always existed, then how does that connect with the idea of the Big Bang? I think it manifests itself in a new way. It's the idea of it's a manifestation of God. It's so, not that it, it existed, but he's manifesting it in a way. Like he's, uh, there might be some holes to that. I'm gonna be, is, if I agree with you a little bit. Is matter eternal then? Well, energy is. Because everything just turns back to energy, from what I understand. But I, I'm not a scientist. I haven't studied science in a long time, so I don't want to make sure I'm. I might just be. But I think, from what I understand, there's energy never dies. So. Energy matter is a form of energy, I believe, and but it's just it be, like. But it can't be eternal if there was a beginning of the universe, can it? If the universe. It well, yeah, you're right in that sense. You're right in that sense. Universe had a, if the universe had a, a beginning, mm -hmm. um, there's only two conclusions: either there were beginnings and cycles. Mm -hmm. This is this universe is just one cycle of many cycles and eternal recurrence. Yeah. Uh, so either that's your position, that that everything's like an eternal occurrence, or are you saying that matter always existed and then at the Big Bang it just manifested manifested itself in a different in a, in a in a way that we. That matter existed in a way that we didn't understand, and then it's manifested in itself in the universe the way we see it. Well, you know, I you know, it's sad, Jason. I like both of those. I don't know how to choose because well, I actually kind of like. <laughs> it's a tough call because I can see it both ways. It's but, it's one of those things we just can't. It's hard to know. But the know? point is, is yeah. is that whatever position you take, whether you say mm -hmm. God, whether you say ideas existed before. Or whether you say matter, we can ask this question: Is the concept able to sustain itself? So the question is: If matter is eternal, like you said, mm -hmm. how does matter sustain itself eternally? Well, and I believe energy does, energy is eternal, and it, it has a way of sustaining itself. You, you could, I couldn't tell you. I, I'll be honest with you. I don't know if I'm ahead. 
I'm sure we could do some research and find it, but I believe that's part of the thermo, the first law of thermodynamics. I think that energy doesn't, I think energy doesn't go away. How it does it, I don't know. To give you an honest answer. So the point what I'm getting at mm -hmm. is that there's there's only a few options. There's only a few few options really. Either matter is eternal, and that it sustains itself. Which is, which is, if it's eternal, if matter is eternal and it sustains itself, then it can't do that because matter would have to have eternal properties. And matter is is not eternal by its very nature. Matter had to have come into existence by its very nature because it's it's about space. It's about properties. So by its very nature, it can't sustain itself, and it can't be eternal. Hmm. So, so it's just not—it's not a viable option. The only other option that you have is spirit, that something beyond matter, and that would be able to sustain itself because it would have all energy and power within itself, and it's not limited by space hmm. or has the properties, and that—that that either is theistic kind of God or it's or it's a personal God um, and yeah. so when you're saying that nothing means there is something you still in the you still got the problem then of this issue about matter because if you're saying that nothing is a concept of something then really it's just matter in a different form and if it's matter, then matter is eternal. And if matter is eternal, it's contradictory because it can't be eternal because it has properties. And if it has properties, it's in space. And if it's in space, it can't be eternal because it's limited. It has the, you've got to go out ta outside space and outside time to be eternal. Hmm. Uh, so it, it's not a viable option. Um, I don't think. I think that's why you have to move into metaphysics, into philosophy, into in not a move. That there's got a there's a point at which you got to move away from science and move into philosophy. Mm -hmm. um, you know that's why a lot of atheists don't like philosophy because it you, you science can take you so far. Then you've got to uh, move into philosophy. So for me. Um, that's an issue that I, I think there's a problem, and the uh, issue concerning uh, Genesis and and saying the things that you're saying, um, um, I I think that um, I I just have a problem for myself is mm -hmm. uh, in believing evolution is just basically on a philosophical point of view. If you believe evolution then you've got three major philosophical problems. There is ought distinction, the naturalist fallacy, and the moral fallacy. The is ought distinction says that you can't get uh, an ought from an is. Uh, that is, David, you mentioned that from nature you can't get a right and wrong. Right and wrong doesn't tell you what from nature. And the naturalist fallacy is that you try to say what is right and what is wrong, and yet you believe in evolution. That's a fallacy. So can I stop you for? Can I ask you, like, in what sense of right or wrong are you talking about? I'm I'm saying in a, if you're saying that, if you're saying that something is right or wrong in an objective sense, if you say it's always wrong to rape a five-year-old kid, if you say that is objectively wrong, right? Mm -hmm. If you say that. And you're making a naturalistic fallacy in the sense that if you believe in evolution, you're not at liberty to say that because evolution is not a basis for you to be able to say what right and wrong is, objectively speaking, because there is no right and wrong within evolution, within that position. It's only what you're inventing. I see what you're saying. I, I think, though, it doesn't hurt. It, you're right in the sense of an atheist saying it, because they're, they're definitely arguing from subjective morality. 
which that's where, if, if you believe in evolution from an atheistic perspective, you would have to agree that reality is subjective. But from a Christian perspective, if you believe in evolution, remember what I said, it's the how, not the why. So however we got here, however we are to this point, it doesn't matter because that was God's plan. Like whatever method we had to go through, whatever steps we had to do to get to where we're man and woman, like that, it doesn't, I, you're right. And what you said, it was right for an atheistic viewpoint, but it wouldn't contradict a Christian world point, world but viewpoint. It, it would, evolution would, because mm -hmm. on two, on two things, the Thunderfoot said, mm -hmm. said it quite beautifully. He said, if this position that you're on about is, this allegorical idea about Genesis. Mm -hmm. If that is true, mm -hmm. then Jesus died for an allegory. You see, when Jesus died, yeah. he was actually dying for literal sin. That literally came into history. It was not an allegory about Adam and Eve falling into sin and then sin went on through the human race. and human beings sinning and making mistakes. When he died on that cross and he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It wasn't for an allegory. It was because sin had infected the world. It had poisoned the world and it needed to be dealt with. And the only way to deal with it from God's perspective is he paid our price. He paid the price of our sin. By, and, it, and it was so horrific. The moral, the universe is so, the universe is not an impersonal place. It's a, it, from the Christian perspective, it's a moral universe. When we make mistakes, creation groans under our failing. It's a moral universe, and something came into the universe that made the universe sick. And mm -hmm. the Bible calls it sin. And the way to deal with that from a Christian perspective is Jesus took the full force of the consequences of that sin upon himself for us to redeem us and to redeem nature. Because it says there's going to be a, heaven, a new heaven and a new earth. That even now nature's groaning under the sin of human beings. You know, sin, you know, uh, the novels of J.R. Tolkien, when he, he, you know, and he talks about the rising of these uh, evil empires and he talks about the trees were groaning. And you, you remember in Lord of the Rings how the trees came out and, and fought the battle yeah. of evil. You know, and nature's groaning. Even nature is groaning under humanity's failure, and it, it's a real poison that's in the uni It's in the it's in the world, and it and it's really sick. And you know, the 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 atheist and the world say human beings are going to pull themselves up. They're going to sort it out. The Bible, in Genesis one, two, three, is showing human beings are not going to pull themselves up by the bootstraps, that things are going to get worse. And even though we might have progressed in certain ways, we've never been able to deal with the issue of power. We don't know how to deal with power. And like in The Lord of the Rings, where the guy had the ring on his finger, he couldn't handle power. And that's ultimately what it came sin is. It's about we are thinking we, we can be gods, and we can't handle that power. And we become proud and we fail and we, we make a mess of things. And Jesus is the only one who could handle power because he was God and he came down and he humbled himself and he took our punishment for us. And it was a literal thing that he did because it was literally poisonous. Our pride is poisoning the, the world around us. And so, you know, no matter how much we advance technologically, we're always going to make a mess of it because there's this thing in us of the I. We want to be the center. And God came down in human flesh and showed that it's not about us being at the center. It's about us dying for each other. It's about us giving it, giving ourselves for each other. And Christ showed us what true love is by dying to self, by laying down his life for others. Couldn't and, know. And that's what it's, it's, so it's about. Literal, from my perspective. I'm sorry. Uh, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Um, but couldn't it be about to, couldn't sin, okay, so well, say it isn't, so, okay, without, so f with free will, doesn't there have to be the option to sin if you have free will, and could, because of that option, because you can't, if you, I mean, the, for me, I thought, the, I always understood the idea of sin as disobedience to God. Yeah. So, 
with free will comes the choice to be obedient or disobedient. And it, it still seems like it could make sense without original sin, the idea that uh, sinful nature is passed down, that Jesus Christ still would need to die on the cross for us. Because he's dying, in the sense, for what we've chosen, for the times we've chosen to disobey God, basically for our sin. Like, it doesn't seem like he would just have to die on the cross just for the original sin Adam had. Uh, and the other re the reason why I also why I have such a big problem with original sin is, is that it seems very unfair to me that the, these people, Adam and Eve, would say, and then God would allow that in sinful nature to be passed on to others. Like, especially knowing the consequences of how horrible it would be with this sin in the world. Like, it makes more sense to me that sin is a natural thing because we can choose to disobey God, and we still need redemption from our sins, than to say, well, God allowed a sinful nature to be passed on to find the children of Adam guilty for something that they didn't particularly choose. I, I know what you're saying. Uh, a couple of things there. Number one is when Adam and Eve sinned, it affected, it taught, you know, it said, you know, there'll be thorns and thistles and, and things like that come up now. It's going to be hard for you to work. So even nature was affected by their sin. Now, the trees didn't have a choice. They didn't have any free will. And they were affected by Adam's sin. And so what I'm saying is uh, original sin, it, God is not holding individuals guilty for original, the actual religion, original sin of Adam and Eve. They're guilty. They're, they're, he holds them individually accountable. But what Adam and Eve did, it's, it, op it, it, no. it brought... No. It brought a catastrophe. It's kind of like it's kind of like um, on the Titanic and and the captain and the people, the captain and a couple of the um, sailors. They're not they're not focused on on um, on driving the ship. You know, I'm just thinking about the Titanic. They're not focused about driving the ship, and they hit an iceberg. That iceberg. When, when the Titanic hit the iceberg, it brought a catastrophe on everybody else. And that's what it was like with Adam and Eve. It brought a catastrophe. And, and so Christ is dealing with our individual sin, but he's also dealing with the cat catastrophe. And the, the other thing is, is we look at things from an individualistic, individualistic perspective. Uh, in, in Europe and American culture, we can be very individualistic. But in Romans chapter five, it's talking about two two nations, two two kingdoms. Uh, I'll just explain it to you. It says in Romans five, it says this. Um, I'll just get it. Um, hey, pull it up real quick. I just gotta run. I gotta grab something in the oven real quick. So go ahead and pull that up. I'll be back in one second. Okay. All right, mate. All right. Yep. Hope everybody's okay. Just having a few minutes, and uh, hope everybody's okay. And love to everybody out there. Hi, bro. I'll just say love to everybody out there. Excellent. I do gotta let you know. Uh, I'm probably gonna leave in about five more minutes. I gotta put my kid to bed. Okay. Uh, but I'd love for you, please, finish your last point. Yeah. Uh, I just want to tell you how much I enjoyed our conversation today. You too, Skylar. I've really enjoyed it, mate. Uh, I, all I was saying is about this issue, I, I think it was a good point about uh, Adam and Eve. Uh, I think the thing is, is it's not about people are being judged because of Adam and Eve. Everybody's judged for the individual sin, this is how I understand it. But what Adam and Eve did, it brought a catastrophe in the world. It's kind of like the Titanic hitting an iceberg. As soon as it hits the iceberg, everybody in the ship 
they're innocent, but it's brought a catastrophe. It affects them. And so when Adam and Eve sinned, it brought a catastrophe. And so Jesus is dying for our individual sin, but he's also dying to put right what Adam and Eve failed hmm. to do. Um, and so it says in Romans chapter 5, it says, Wherefore as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by a sin, and sin to death passed unto all men, for that all have sinned, for unto the law sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that have not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression. It was the figure of him that was to come. Now this is the point. But not as the offence, so also is the free gift. For if through the offence of one many be dead, much more the grace of God, the gift of grace which is by one man, Jesus Christ, who abounded unto many. And not as it was by one that sinned, so it is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offences unto justification. For if by one man's offence death reigned by one, much more they which received abundance of grace and of the gift of the righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Now it says it, he says it three times. By one man's disobedience, many became unrighteous, is another translation. Man, one man's obedience, many became righteous. And it says it three times. Now, if it says it three times, it's telling you this is very important. And so what it's saying is, Adam was a representative of the human race, and by his sin, many were brought into death. Jesus now is the representative of the human race, and by his obedience, many become righteous. And, and so it, it's not our individualistic society the way we're to look at it in that passage. We're to look at it as heads. Adam was ahead of the human race at that time. And when he failed, it brought consequences for everyone. Jesus is now the new head. When he succeeds, it brings benefits for us. And that's how Romans 5 is, is looking at it. I think that's a good place to leave it, Jason. All right. I, uh, I, I liked your answers. I appreciate them. I think you're very genuine and honest uh, in everything you say, and I think you gave some really good answers tonight, to All be right. honest with you. So, you, uh, you too, mate. I enjoyed every minute of it, bro. Absolutely. Uh, I'll try to come on your show again. Just uh, keep inviting me, and I'll try to come on when I'm available, all right? All right, mate. Love to you, mate. God All right. Bless. Have a good night, buddy. Bye-bye. You too. Take care, bro. God bless.